Hey, church family, welcome. Thank you for being here. Those of you who are in the building, it is so good to see you. And for those of you who have tuned in online, we just want to say thank you for joining us and tuning in. And hey, maybe you're new here. Maybe this is your first time or your first couple of times. Uh, we would simply love to connect with you as a church family and get you connected here at the life of our church. And so in the chair backs in front of you, 
there is a connection card. And if you're watching online, there will be a link in the comments that uh, you can fill out as much information as you're comfortable sharing with us. But we would love to reach out and just get you uh, plugged in and connected to uh, any and every part of our church body that you would uh, love to dive into. And on the back of those cards are prayer requests. And each week we pray for all of those as a staff team that come in. And uh, that's one of the joys of our week is when we get to share with you as church family uh, and praying with you and for you and for those that you love and care about and whatever's going on. And so uh, please fill those out. You can drop those in the drop boxes as you leave. Uh, but today we are in our series called Acts Like It, and uh, we're continuing on in this series. And what we've been looking at through the series is the early church and how God uses them. Barry has an awesome message today about this idea that God takes ordinary people who say yes to him and he does extraordinary things through them especially outside the walls of the church or the temple or the building that God wants to work in our everyday lives. It's a great message, so stay tuned for that. But would you stay standing as we continue to worship?
Thank you. You can go ahead and have a seat. As we go into communion, there will be buckets on the right-hand side of each row with the communion elements. If you would grab those and pass those down. Uh, this week, we're going to do communion just a little bit different. I want to give you guys some time to simply reflect. And so I want to read a passage of scripture and uh, share a thought real quick. But it's Romans chapter 6, and this is what Paul writes to the Roman church. He says, now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Each week we take communion here we talk about this idea that the, the bread represents the body of Christ that was broken for you and for me. And the juice represents Christ's blood shed for each and every one of us, for our sin, for our mess, for our brokenness. And God sends Jesus, his son, to live a perfect life, to live a life that you and I couldn't live for ourselves. And in exchange, Jesus says, I, I will die and, and God will raise me. And you can put the weight and the trust and the hope of your life on that and in exchange receive my righteousness, my grace, my peace. And so as we share that, the line that sticks out to me is this line that death no longer has dominion over Christ. And I wanted to simply encourage you today, maybe you're in here and you're a believer and you need some encouragement to your faith. Just remember that you have laid the weight and the trust of your life on a God who sin and death and mess and brokenness has zero dominion over him. And Paul says you should live likewise. He encourages us with that. Maybe you're not a believer in here today. You're like, I don't know how I feel about the whole Jesus thing. That's the deal on the table. Is that Jesus says, hey, your mess, your brokenness, whatever you're carrying, you don't have to carry it anymore. 
God laid it all on me on the cross and you can simply hand it over and I'll give you grace and peace in return. So when you're ready, I'm gonna step back and just give you a moment. Take the elements as you're ready and then I'll close this out in prayer here in just a moment. you. We love you, and I thank you for your son, Jesus. God, I thank you that each week we get to come in here and we get to have this moment of communion where we're reminded and we get to remember that you sent your son and that he did what we couldn't do in our place, and he did it for us, and he simply presents to us the opportunity to just take all of our stuff and and to lay it on him and to just receive righteousness and his goodness and your grace in our lives. God, I pray that you would simply remind us of that moment by moment, day by day, as we go about our week and our life, that we would remember who Christ is and what he's done and that we would live as those who understand that. It's in Jesus' precious name that I pray, amen. Let's take a look at this missions moment. UCC. My name is Jared Hinkey, and I'm a church planner with Mustard Seed Network in Kyoto, Japan. Uh, recently, we have seen a lot of change in our church. At the end of last year, we were able to appoint four local elders to serve this church. And this is a huge step in an amazing work that God has done in this young urban church in Japan. We also celebrated five years as a church as a gathering of people worshiping God together, uh, being a community based around the gospel and sharing our faith with the world around us. In March of this year, we appointed Shin Yoshieda to step into the role of lead pastor of Mustard Seed Christian Church in Kyoto. And this is exciting to see God raising up local leaders who will carry on the vision uh, of seeing gospel-centered community grow in Kyoto. And our staff has grown in number as well. And throughout all this change, God has continued to change lives. We've been celebrating new life in Christ, and people are growing in their faith. In the last several weeks, we celebrated three baptisms from three different people from three different countries. So not only is God using this church to reach people from the second largest unreached people group in the world, but he's also reaching the nations as well. And I want to say thank you, UCC, for partnering with us in this. God is using your prayers and your support to spread the gospel around the world. And you're playing a part in God changing lives for eternity here in Japan. So thank you. And I look forward to being able to share more of the amazing things that God will do here in Kyoto, Japan. Each week here at Offering Time, we we like to share our missions moment uh, just simply to help paint the picture of what is possible through Uh, each and every one of us individually, but really coming together collectively to saying yes to God with our finances and with what he's given us. You know, we got to hear from Jared and he's in Kyoto and there's Ethan in Sendai and uh, we have the Fries and they're in Zimbabwe. And then we have so many missionaries. We have missionaries in places that we can't share about where they're at or their names and things like that, that are taking the gospel to people that uh, may never hear it otherwise. And we're able to partner with so many organizations, so many missionaries, so many individuals like that, both near and far, all because of we, the body, collectively coming together and partnering with God and what he's doing around the globe uh, to take the gospel out. And uh, we, we're capable of doing more together than we ever are individually alone. And that's the beauty of this. And so I want to say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and for your generosity and you continually saying yes and yes and yes again to God, to simply partner with him in the work that he's doing around the globe. Um, 
it, it makes more of an impact than we can ever communicate through a video, but that's why we share that. Um, if you came prepared to give today, uh, as always, there are the black uh, drop boxes as you leave. If you have a physical gift, you can put it in there, uh, or you can text the number on the screen and it'll send you a prompt, or you can check out the UCC Hub app or our website at university.church slash give to do that. Uh, and while you're doing that, let's take a look at church news. This series has been talking about us as the church, and we're taking our church out of this building Sunday, September 24th for Church in the Park. For years, we've called this event UCC One, a chance for us to all be together in one service. And while we love the opportunity, the name doesn't quite convey to our city and outsiders, visitors, what it is. Thus, Church in the Park. Church in the Park is held at City Park at their band shell at 10.30 a.m. on September 24th. Bring your coffee or tea in a mug, bring a blanket or lawn chair, bring a friend. Church in the Park is a great opportunity to invite someone who's hesitant to come into a church building because it's just a beautiful morning at the park. Church in the Park will include our normal elements, worship, communion, a message, but then stick around for connection, fun, and lunch for free after. So mark your calendar. No services will be held on our church campus September 24th. Meet us at 10.30 a.m. at the park instead. Faith isn't meant to be something you do outside of community. Life isn't meant to be private. Men, that applies to you as well. Make time next month to attend Uncommon Men's Conference happening October 13th through the 14th here in this building. You'll have three sessions, group and individual reflection, games, time around a fire, and a chance to walk towards God locked arms with other men. We think men middle school and up can be equipped through this experience. In fact, if you're a dad, pay the $65 registration and you can register your son for $35. Sons, invite your dad for the weekend and give him the $30 off. Men, commit to attending with your life group or Bible study. Wives, surprise your husband, sign him up. <laughs> Joking, kind of. Registration is now live. Visit university.church slash uncommon or find it in the events tab of the UCC Hub app to learn more. Serve one another. Serve the living God. Serve in the new way of the Spirit. We see service modeled in the New Testament as a way for followers of Jesus to love the Lord and the world around them. Jump into serving this fall by being a part of one of our serving teams. That can be greeting, production, kids, youth, coffee bar, more, you name it. Find the details in the UCC Hub app or at university.church slash serve. You have something to offer. That's how God made you. And the church needs you to step into your gifts. If you want to plug into serving this fall, again, you can visit university.church slash serve or click the serve button in the UCC Hub app. We love to celebrate with those who have decided to follow Jesus with everything they have and commit themselves through baptism. Last Sunday, we had someone at the 9.30 and 11 a.m. services decide to get baptized. Today, we wanted to share another baptism with you that happened quite a few weeks ago. Check it out. Hi, my name is Jade. I finally decided to make the formal commitment to follow Jesus today um, on my birthday. <laughs> Uh, since becoming a mom, really, my eyes have been open to all of the blessings I've received, and I felt it was finally time to make the commitment and build a stronger relationship. So, Jay, today we are here at the lake because you decided to follow Jesus with everything you have and everything you are. So, would you repeat after me? I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is Son of the Living God. Is Son of the Living God. That He lived and died for me. That He lived and died for me. And being resurrected, he brought me into new life. And being resurrected, he brought me into new life. And I want to follow him for the rest of my life. And I want to follow him for the rest of my life. All right, <laughs> upon your confession of faith, if you want to, if you want to plug your nose, <laughs> I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's stand and sing. Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life. 
to the one who created you, the one who formed you. He says this, do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine.
you, Lord. We love you. And we thank you that you have brought us out of darkness and into light and out of death and into life. We thank you for the way that you have already done a miracle inside of each one of us. And we know that there's more coming. We know that you take the ordinary and you make it extraordinary. And so, Lord, I pray that you would do that today in us. In Jesus' name. There's a storyline that plays out in your life and in my life more often than we might recognize. See, most of us feel just simple, ordinary, nothing special. Ain't we are drawn to the stories of extraordinary. Ain't we love watching movies, reading books, listening to documentaries, and seeing these things where, wow, that's so awesome. Look at what happened in their life. And, but, yeah, my, maybe someday, but I'm, I'm just ordinary. You know, it's crazy how this storyline plays out in our head because it's just an ordinary day. We get up. We go to work, we go to school, we do what we do, then we come home, we go to bed, then we go through it again, and then an ordinary day leads to an ordinary week. And then there's this week after week, and it starts to become predictable, and we start to kind of feel this is the way it is, and then it's an ordinary month. And then we have a few months, and then all of a sudden it's a year, and then years turn to decades and into a life, and it's just... It's just my life. It's just ordinary. Nothing really special can happen in my life because it's just normal. You know, God does the most amazing things when we let him encounter our ordinary. He turns the ordinary into extraordinary. And here's the amazing thing. You don't have to be special. You don't have to have some special gift. You don't have to be in this amazing place. You don't have to have him speak out of a cloud or out of a burning bush. He doesn't have to do any of that. You just need to be open. Open at heart and open in your eyes. And God does amazing things. Let me unpack this from Acts chapter 3, and it's a story that, that it is just an amazing one of Peter and John, and, and yet God does the most amazing, extraordinary thing in their ordinary day. It starts out in verse 1, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. Now, this is an ordinary day for a Jewish guy. They pray three times a day. They go to the temple. They could walk to the temple blindfolded. It's nothing special. It's just going through the same old, same old. And then in verse 2, it says, As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. Now, this is another image of another guy with an ordinary day. Now, it wasn't an average day. It's just a bad day, but his average day was a bad day. And in fact, we find out he had been crippled since birth, and he'd been this way for 40 years. Now, every day we tend to say, oh, it's been great or it's been bad, and we're like, oh, this is just a bad day sometimes. And can you imagine 40 years every day being a bad day? And it's not just a little bit bad. It's really bad. Because let me give you an insight into the first century belief system. First century people thought this was a curse, a punishment of God if you had a deformity, if you had any kind of a problem, if anything was wrong in your life. 
You're, oh, one of those people. God's mad at you. So here's something that you might not realize. He was outside the temple begging because he wasn't welcome inside the temple. See, the average person would go, oh, no, you're cursed by God. God's mad at you. You've done something wrong. You stay out. And that had been his life. The only hope of survival was could he get a handout from somebody. And he was likely just part of the scenery for the average person walking in because they didn't really want to contact him. They didn't really want to be near him. So they would just kind of avoid or step around and probably not even look at most times because... After all, he's an outcast. He's done something to deserve this. God is upset. And, hmm. You know, two ordinary days, but something extraordinary is about to happen. Now, here's a truth that before we go into the rest of this passage, I, I want to make sure you take this home. When ordinary moments uh, intersected with God, when you say, here you go, God, here's my routine, boring, old, ordinary life, that's a moment where extraordinary things happen and healing becomes possible. See, that's a principle this crippled man was about to find out, and, and I want you to understand that's true for you today as well. So let's pick up in verse 3. It says, when Peter and John were about to enter, he ends up asking them for money. And Peter and John look at him intently. And Peter says, look at us. And, and first of all, this man's not used to looking at people because he's an outcast. He's not wanting any, nobody wants to look at him. And Peter's like, look at us. In other words, it's okay. Eye contact here. I see you. Very important. The lame man looked up eagerly, now expecting some money. And Peter said, I don't have silver or gold for you, but I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. And then Peter took this lame man by the right hand and he helps him up. Now this is amazing. He's now touchable because he wasn't seeable. He wasn't touchable. Peter has pulled him up. And now the beautiful thing happens. As he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, he stood on his feet, he began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Let me stop real quick. I don't pass over that. We read that and he's like, oh, he went inside. Remember who was not welcome before? Remember who was not a part before? Who did not have community? Was the cursed one? Was the outcast? He's going into the temple and so when he's leaping and going, yeah, it's because he's finally welcome in the temple when they realized who this man was, he's the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful, beautiful gate, they were all absolutely astounded. Oh, this guy, I, first of all, I think of his parents. You know, as a, as a grandparent now, I'm just a month in, and, I, and he's like doubled in size, and all he has to do is like just like move his hand, and I'm like, wow. Isn't that awesome? You know, he'll smile at me, and they're like, no, he's not smiling at you, Dad. He has gas. I'm like, no, he saw me, and he smiled at me. I can't wait till he takes his first step. Little Jude is just an adorable little thing. And it made me stop and think of this guy's parents. From the beginning, they went, oh, no. It's going to be a long life for this little one. He comes out cursed by God. He's already an outcast from the beginning. And they never got to see him take his first step. Can you imagine being the mom or the dad of this guy where all of a sudden he is standing up and he doesn't like stand up and take that first weeble wobble step like they kind of do. He stands up and he's fully strengthened, instantly healed. It says he's jumping up and down. I mean, this is absolutely just a point where they're all astounded. It says in verse 10, I don't know about you, but I love, I love seeing somebody just where they come to life, where they see joy, where they have hope, and those extraordinary moments when, when life is spoken to somebody who was destitute, when, when hope was given to someone who was down and, and just an outcast feeling. See, I know that you all want to see that as well. And it's my vision that we as a church be a people where that happens wherever we go. 
Outside this church, and we have people that are from one side to the other side of the United States joining us online. We have from Washington State all the way to Washington, D.C., down to Florida and all over the Midwest. And wherever you are, what my vision is, is that God would do the extraordinary through your ordinary simple life. And you go, but I'm just ordinary. No, that's exactly what I'm saying. God does the extraordinary, not us as we just give him the ordinary moments of life. So how do we do this? Well, it's vital that you learn to open your eyes to seek the God moments in your everyday life. You got to look for them. You got to see them. You got to look for those things. It's like I mean, years ago, I had a friend of mine. He was an older gentleman, had more experience in small groups, and he, I was just a young punk pastor, and, and he sits me down and says, so Barry, and he's like, where have you seen God at work this week? And I felt like there was a spotlight on me. I'm going to fail. Oh, no. I went, like, oh, what miraculous. Oh, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to have all this. Special. Oh, what did God do? I don't know. And, I, and then he's like, well, don't, you're thinking way more than I am thinking. He says, there's all kinds of bad stuff that happens in society. And I just want to know where have you seen God at work in some way? Something you're thankful for. Something that's good. Because you got to look for it. This world is full of bad news. So where have you seen God at work? Because if you're not looking for it, you're not going to see it. I'm like, that's a good, and that's transformed how I do Bible study, how I interact with people. It it changes how I see life because I want to look for the God moment. We all have the bad moment. We wake up to bad morning in America every day, and and then we just kind of live it out. And God wants to do something good. You know, in this, Peter and John had been going to the same place, the temple, for years. But they're going now with a new purpose. They've gone from a very religious life to now a relationship with Jesus, and they just want to make him known. They want to get it out there. They want others to find the same thing that they have found. And now, wherever they go, same old routine, same old life, they have a new purpose. See, once you find Jesus, that ought to happen in our lives, but so often we're like, yeah, that's going to happen in somebody's life, but I'm just ordinary. No, 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 no. You're his. And once you're his, then you are part of Jesus' team, and that changes everything. So you go about, whether it's the grocery store, whether it's the gym, whether it's the coffee shop, whether it's your job, whether it's walking into your own house, don't miss that. Ministry can happen through you if you're just stopping and saying, God, here's my ordinary life. What do you want to do? Use me. It's a new purpose. Same old place, new purpose. Uh, Let's just play this out at church here. This happened in Peter and John outside the temple or their church in basically the parking lot. So how much do you think happened out in our parking lot today? How much healing happened? How much hope was, uh, I doubt any. Why? Well, it's been a blessing and a curse, something that's happened in our lives called technology. Technology. So I am so thankful for cars that we don't have to walk everywhere. I'm so thankful that we have air conditioning in our cars when it's hot and heat when it's cold. I mean, it's, it's awesome. And so we don't have to walk next to anybody hardly. We don't have to talk to them. We don't have to see them. We don't have to interact with them. We push a button. The garage door goes up. We pull out. Windows up. Merry music on. And we drive on out. We push a button. The door goes back down. We keep everybody at a safe distance. And then once we have to exit our car, what's the first thing? I I see you all do this every Sunday. You're walking in and you're... (laughs) And I just laugh. I'm like, come on, we got to get our heads... Now, I'm going to tell you, I am not down on phones. I wouldn't remember an appointment. I wouldn't know how to drive places. I wouldn't know what's going on in my world without this dumb little thing. I'm thankful for this. But our cars, our homes, our technology, our phones are such a distraction to where we don't even stop and see the people around us. And so we walk in, and I'll see a whole group of you all walking in, and you all are on your phone. You don't even talk to the people that you know that you came with. Yeah. It's time to put the phone away and start to see people, and then God might do something cool along the moment. 
See, here's the thing I believe. I believe every day is filled with divine appointments if we'll open our eyes and just submit our routine everyday life to God and say, here you go. But a lot of those divine appointments are missed. They're missed because we just don't see. And so I want to ask you to stop, to look, to see, because there is someone in your life who needs help or hope or healing. There is somebody you're going to encounter today who needs help or hope or healing. In fact, that might even be you. And where has that shown up? These are moments around us that we have to be looking for or we'll just miss them. Now, I would love, I've always said, man, I just wish God would tell me exactly what to do, when to do, how to, I mean, if he just telegraphed, you know, where's the next God moment? Just telegraph it to me. But you know, I think I'd screw it up if he did. I think you would too. I'm glad he doesn't. See, here's what I'm saying is we'll do one of two things when we have a God moment. If he were to tell us what's about to happen and how he wants to use us, we'd either get all excited and run ahead of him and do something like Peter and John. If they told him, hey, you're getting ready to meet a blind beggar, he's gonna, and they're like, okay, I'll get my wallet, God. And they would have given him money instead of giving him the healing that he needed. They would have, I think we run ahead of God. If we knew what we were going to do, we run out ahead. Or the other side, more often, is we've gone, whoa, God. Um, yeah, um, I think you got the wrong person. You, you, I, I, I'm not ready for that. And they're, oh, no, just walk with me. We're going to be okay. I'm about, no, 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 no. You, you got somebody else, uh, not, not me. See, either we run ahead or we pull back. And he says, just walk with me today. Just walk with me. Let me just, one step at a time, and we'll figure it out. Let me do something here with you. You know, uh, it's giving him the everyday moment. This is important. This is coming together as the body of Christ. We talked about community last week. Vital. If you missed last week's sermon, you got to listen to that. Chris gave a powerful message. You know, we do some great stuff, worship and the Lord's Supper and Bible study and all these things, but that's not the church really. That's preparing us to go be the church. And give you a simple little example of how this can play out in my life. I have to watch. Same as you. Yeah, I have, man, I prepare and I pray and I get ready for, and this is a big moment each week as I prepare to share the gospel. But you know, God wants to use me outside and off of this stage and outside this building just as much. In fact, I've found that he uses me more out there than he does here. Let me give you a little simple example, and I think this is something you might identify with because we all walk around. If you go to the gym, you probably had headphones on, you got your phone, you're, it's my time, leave me alone, and that's kind of a, a now society. We all are. I had a friend talk me into saying, hey, you got to come check out my gym, and, and so I, I was like, I got everything I need at home. I don't, this is my time. This is just where me, and I, I get alone. And he's like bugging me. He's like, no, you need to come check out my gyms. I'm like, okay. So I finally went to the gym and I started working out. And I was like, oh, this is nice. This is a good place. And get to know a few other people. But most of the time, I put on my earphones, kind of do my thing, get after it. I'm like, I really love heavy lifting and getting after it and having fun. And, and then God has the audacity to try and step in and interrupt my plans. I mean, it's just rude. I and all of a sudden, he convicts me. He's like, maybe you need to like talk to some people, the thing that you tell everybody else to do. Oh, well, I am so glad he did. He convicted me that at my everyday, just normal, ordinary routine of going to the gym, it's something I enjoy to do, that he wants to shine light out there just like he does here. And so I'm like, okay. So I start looking at that. I talk to the guy who owns the gym. He's like, hey, can I do like a Bible study here? And he's like, absolutely. So we start doing a Bible study. I just start getting to know people. You know, out of that, I've done weddings. I've done funerals. I've helped people go deal with I mean, uh, bad affairs and, and end of life potential stuff. I, I've, I've got to walk people through and get to share the gospel. I, I've got to do some counseling. I, I've got to be able to be there to baptize people. It's just been amazing. But I had to open my eyes to something I wasn't doing, and it's changed my world. You know, out of that, let me share a, a young gal I met. Uh, her name's Maria, and I got to know her about a year ago, and then out of that relationship, I actually got to meet another guy by the name of Alexis, and, and, uh, and their brother and sister, and let me just share a little bit of their story with you. So I'm going to start with you, Maria. Um, you know, 
know, something major happened in your faith over this past year or so. Would you describe that? So I'd say maybe a year ago, I was really caught up in religion's game and getting all those checks boxes, like, checked off and, you know, just having that calendar and making sure I did everything right. And, you know, I'd go to church on Sundays. I'd go to confessions. I'd, you know, go to worship nights. So I feared God in a really unhealthy way. A year later, I discovered Bible study at (laughs) your gym. And that's where I got to learn that I can't hide from God. He sees all parts of me and through the brokenness and anxiety and just this big load of just hurt and depression. He wanted all of it. He said, give it to me, daughter. Like, I got it. I'm a big God. And that's when the transformation of, you know, I stopped treating God like a boss. And I started having a relationship with him like a daughter and a father. So you actually uh, were planning on getting baptized. Yeah. The Sunday before, you invited your brother, Alexis, and you came to, to church with her, right? Yes, sir, I did. Yep, she brought me along with her. I walked up to you, and I'm like, oh, you're Maria's brother. Your first reaction was you put your hand up, and you said, I'm here to support her. <laughs> it was, oh, yes. It was yes. back off, preacher. <laughs> now, after service, do you remember what you said on the way out? Yeah, um, I told you that um, I got really touched for the first time in my life. Yeah. Um, And then um, I basically just gave you a short story of my life. And uh, I told you how I wanted to get baptized. And from never really stepping into church on my own will um, to wanting to give my life to Christ after one service, it just felt like, you know, like the, the best thing ever because I knew that I was a broken man and uh, I need a change. So um, that's what I decided to do was get baptized the following Sunday. There was a big transformation in you. Describe the before and the after. Yeah, so, I mean, to be completely honest, I was living for the world. Um, I had no clue who Jesus was. I mean, I knew, you know, he was the guy on the crucifix, right? Um, but I didn't know the great sacrifice he had done for us. I didn't have a relationship with God. I was a sinful man. I was a lustful man. I was selfish. I, uh, there was times where I, I don't know, I didn't really want to live anymore. Um, I felt purposeless. And uh, April 16th was, um, it was the beginning of a, of a new life. Um, from then, from that point on, I knew that I needed to make change. Yeah. And although I'm not perfect, I have made a lot of progress. Um, I no longer hold on to possessions, uh, money. Um, now I value my relationships uh, with my family, um, with my loved ones, and most importantly, I have a relationship with God, which is what I needed in my entire life, you know? I just never knew that until I stepped foot here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and one of the big things is um, I was able to let go of things. Um, so that was one thing that I would always hold on to, is just whether it was anger, fear, anxiety, depression, I was just able just to let it go. And it was the best feeling in the world. If you were to say just one thing, Maria, one thing to somebody who's sitting out there thinking, should I? make this step with God. What do you say? Walking by faith and not by sight might sound scary, but it's the most freedom I've ever felt in life. If you're going to say something to somebody sitting out there, what do you say? You know, it's okay to ask for help. Um, It's okay to realize that you're a broken person, you know, whether you're a woman or a man, a child. Um, you look like me, you have tattoos, you don't have tattoos, you have piercings, you don't. It doesn't matter. God has a place for everybody of all colors, of all races. Um, 
and his love is truly unconditional. I have never experienced love like this. Um, and if I encourage somebody to do something, is to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. See, here's the thing. You might think, oh, yeah, that's Maria's and Alexis's story, and that's cool. God did something extraordinary in their life. No, he wants to do something extraordinary in your life. In fact, today, he wants to do something in your ordinary life just like them. But it all comes down to whether you move from that religion to a relationship. It's a whether you say, here is my mess, whatever that is, and just say, God, I give it to you and let him transform you. See, here's the thing. You're not bound by who you always have been. And just as they have their story of who they were to who they're becoming, that's what God wants to do in your life. He wants to take you from where you are to where he's planned for you to go. See, Jesus is bigger than your ethnicity. He's bigger than your gender. He's bigger than all the stuff of this world when it comes to education or titles or homes or cars. He's bigger than your fear. He's bigger than your family. He's bigger than your insecurity. In verse 7, that word instantly just jumps out because God can change decades. He can change lives in an instant, just instantly. And what, what or who you've always been does not mean who you need to be moving forward. It all comes to whether you'll lay it at the foot of the cross and say, okay, Holy Spirit, here I am. Fill me, do something in me because I'm tired of being the old me. I need to put that guy, that gal to death. And he'll do in a moment more than I could do or you could do or we all could do in a lifetime. And whenever that happens, you got to make sure just as they, they pointed everything to Jesus in their testimony, you point your life to Jesus. And when others find, when, they, when you tell someone about your life, when you share your story, it all will all be about his story when it comes down to it. See, people a lot of times are like, well, but, well how do I share? It? Well, all you need to do is ask people their story. And then it says, you know, gives you an opportunity to share your story and how Jesus intersected with your life. And that leads you to the God story. Three stories. It's not that hard. It's just a matter of whether you're willing to lay it down and say, here you go and point people to him. You know, Peter and John were quizzed, like, what happened to this dude? I mean, how did he get healed? I mean, the, do the natural human's way of doing it is to say, you know what? It was just amazing. We were just there, and, and then God did this amazing thing, and I picked him up, and I spoke to him, and then he was walking, and I, I, he didn't do that. You know, when they said, what happened? Just the response was through faith in the name of Jesus is how this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Verse 16, it just says, faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Always point people to Jesus. You know, the crazy thing about this whole encounter was it happened out in the parking lot. <laughs> I just love that. See, it's outside the church where we go be the church. It's out in your life when you go to work. It's out in your neighborhood. It's out in your marriage. It's out there as a parent. It's out there in your dorms. It's out there when we go and we shed light into the darkness. And it's a matter of whether you're willing to say, here you go. Peter and John experienced the amazing power of God and presence out in the parking lot. So God wants to do something outside the church building for you for those around you, but it's gonna require you opening up your life. It's gonna require you seeing people with his eyes, not your own. See, it's out there, not in here. This is important, but it's to prepare you for what you're gonna encounter out there. Go be the church. I'm going to ask you just to stand with me and I'm going to pray and we're going to just invite God's presence into this where he would challenge us and convict us and help us to see how he wants to use us. And so I'm going to ask that as I pray that you would just make this personal to yourself. Please bow with me. Oh God, 
we come before you and we need you so desperately. This world is broken and I'm broken. And so Lord, I ask that you'd clean up this messy life and help me to offer hope to those around me. Help me to see, to touch, to enter into the lives of those who are hurting and God, don't let them just be part of the scenery I walk by. Oh Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that some ordinary circumstance this week in our life would become extraordinary. And we wouldn't wait till next Sunday to hope to to encounter you, but that we would hope to encounter you and to let you intersect with our life as we leave the building today. Oh, come, God, come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wasn't that a great word? Going into this week, I challenge you, how can you bring hope and healing to someone? Whether it's someone you know or someone you don't know, Think about being a change for somebody this week. Being the light that we're called to be. Remember, if you need anything, prayer, resource, or support, or hey, you're like, hey, I forgot to ask for a prayer journal. I really want to hold one. Just send us a message online at university.church. We'd love to connect with you so we can love God, people, and the world where he has you. God bless you.